Um, I'm just going to make two brief announcements before I introduce uh, the chairman, one of the chairmen of our One Town, One Read, my brother Sam, who will do the honors of introducing our speaker. Announcement number one is there are uh, facilities to your left over here, if you should need them. Uh, and announcement number two, if you've got it and it rings, it beeps, it buzzes, please turn it off. <laughs> or at least put it on mute. It's my pleasure now to introduce um, Mark Gilbert. Mark is one of the co-chairs of our One Read, One Town, One Read, My Brother Sam is Dead, along with Aaron Singleton, uh, who I don't think was able to yet make it this evening. But they have done a tremendous amount of work at bringing together all these programs, along with our uh, terrific uh, volunteers on our programming committee and along with our own uh, programmer here in the library, Mac Maggie McIntyre, I just wanted to come up and publicly say thank you so much to them for all the very hard work that they have done and they also deserve a big round of applause. people here in Reading, so many people with different interests and different backgrounds and reasons for being here tonight. How many people in this room are here because they're history buffs? It's over half the room, that's great. How many people are here because they're literature buffs? Same half. <laughs> Why are the rest of you here? <laughs> so so uh, it's great to see everybody, and there's so many interesting and, and knowledgeable people in town, and that's one of the things I think is going to be great uh, as we go through the summer with the Town Wide Read program, is we have a bunch of wonderful events set up. So we, we kicked it off a couple of weeks ago at the Memorial Day Parade, and this event, uh, which we are so fortunate to have the rich resources of the Historical Society here at Reading, who is our co-sponsor, and in particular our speaker tonight, Charlie Couch, is a wonderful way for us to all learn more about the history of Reading. And as Charlie will probably tell you, uh, in terms of understanding, you know, because when I met with Charlie, we, we spent several hours talking about this project and working on it, um, he is an incredible resource on Reading. Now, he wasn't actually born in Reading. He moved here when he was like five weeks old, okay? <laughs> so, uh, he has spent a good amount of time uh, literally out there in the fields, walking along stone walls, looking at quarry sites. He knows where roads were that, you, you know, you and I can't imagine existed at one point in time. And so, we have the pleasure over the, the next hour to learn more about this from Charlie Couch, our town historian. Charlie. Sort of follow up on what Mark started here with how many people actually read the book since it's readily available. Very good. Who hasn't read the book but still is here? Okay, well, you go to the back of the class. I read it as when my kids were reading it in 1968. Oh, okay. You get the retro award. Okay, this is actually quite a fun thing to be able to present this evening for the fact I think it sort of acts as a springboard for a lot of people in town who may not be that familiar with the town's history, have a little inkling of what the uh, revolutionary period was here in town. Uh, so to be able to have a book like this, I think we're very fortunate. One of the things is that uh, there are certain elements to the book that aren't quite true necessarily. However, when I was reviewing the book to be able to put all this together for the presentation, I realized that both Chris and Lincoln Collier really did their homework and that the primary characters you find in the books really are based to some extent upon real characters and their lives in Reading during that period. It 
this great map, which everybody has a copy of, uh, was put together recently by Amy Tabbitt, who lends her artistic skills. So let's all give a round of applause for Amy. And she was very receptive to my input as to what should go on the map in the first place. It gets a little bit complicated at times, especially when we're talking about churches, the early churches in Reading, and where they were located, because the congregational church shifted around a bit, as we'll see. One of the things that I've encountered over the years with some people trying to discuss either this book or really the Revolutionary Period in Reading is sort of the fundamentals of some of the terminology that's applied to uh, the various entities within town. Most people are familiar with both patriots and loyalists. Uh, a lot of people are unaware, and they can, can get confused a little bit, about Whigs and Tories. And keep in mind, really, there weren't many party affiliations uh, in Reading's politics at the time. It is something that you saw sort of on a broader scale, but they were applicable. So you had Whigs, uh, which tended to be the Patriots and the Loyalists were Tories. Actually, if you go to Canada these days in the parliamentary system up there, you still have the Conservative Party that's referred to as the Tory Party, as in England as well. Uh, when it came to the military divisions, you also had the Continentals, uh, which were really the soldiers under George Washington, and you also had the Provincials, and in some cases, the Loyalists that did sign up uh, to, to bear arms uh, for the Loyalist cause during the Revolutionary War, uh, carried that name, the Provincials. All soldiers out of New England, and especially out of Reading, as we know, prior to the Revolutionary War and going back to the Seven Years' War and the various French and Indian Wars, the British regulars always referred to the militia members that were called up every so often as being Provincials. And to some extent it, was, it could be seen as a derogatory term. <coughs> Congregationalists, and this is where the book gets a little bit confusing sometimes because they're all referred to as Presbyterians. And the question came up quite a few years ago, well, why don't they just call them Presbyterians? Well, the fact is, by this time, there's really no difference between a Presbyterian and a Congregationalist, and that goes back to something called the Saybrook uh, Platform of the Saybrook Convention of 1711, uh, where the Congregationalists enacted certain things uh, overseeing their churches that basically put them in line with what we call Presbyterian Church. They're both Calvinist. Okay? Um, and I think the Colliers did that for the fact that they knew outside of New England uh, a congregational church is basically non-existent. They're all Presbyterian when you get to the other states. So I think as far as just trying to appeal to a broader audience outside of New England is why they went with the Presbyterian. And don't forget, they're descended from the Puritans. In Connecticut, all the way until 1818, the Congregational Church was the established church in Connecticut. Okay. On the other side, under the Loyalists, you have the Episcopalians. In the book, they always refer to them as Anglicans. The fact is, they were never called Anglicans around here. Um, and we'll show that in a minute. Uh, one of the things was, during the Revolutionary War, those loyalists that wanted to stay in town basically had to take an oath of fidelity. And so if you can imagine your selectmen in town at the time saying, if you want to reside and if you want to keep a low profile, we're not going to bother you, but you'll have to take an oath of fidelity to the then state of Connecticut. Uh, Patriot caused the local militia, except in one early instance, which we'll show in a minute, uh, all serve the Patriot cause. Okay, our protagonist in the story, everyone's aware of Timothy Meeker. And this is where the Collier Brothers did a great job. I think they probably went through the old burying ground at the Episcopal Church and looked at the headstones and took a little count of what names they saw there and also looked at the local history as well. The Meekers were a real family, uh, and actually they're really a good example to be able to use in the book for the fact that they're a split family. You've got some that are serving the Patriot cause, and you've got some, like the original Jonathan Meeker Jr., 
that are associated with the Anglican Church, and they are basically loyalists. Okay? They support the King of England. Now, in the book, they describe him as and the family and uh, life, the father to Timothy uh, and his mother are running a tavern. This house here, 214 Black Rock Turnpike, which was always dated about 1800, and they, everyone had assumed that it was built by John Meeker, uh, one of the grandsons to uh, the original Meekers that settled up on Reading Ridge, was built about 1800. I had the opportunity to do further research on it, and this turns out to be, as you look at it, it's a full two stories high. Uh, in fact, this house, when it was constructed, was a salt box design. It was also a house that was built most likely by John Meeker's grandfather, Jonathan uh, I, in the 1730s. So it's actually sort of one of those little gems of an antique house that was overlooked for many years. Now the truth about the Meeker family, and why you probably see Jonathan Meeker up here, is the fact that many of the people that settled up on Reading Ridge early on, and some of those that didn't settle before a church was established there at the time, were outliers. They were people that were not part and didn't necessarily want to be part of an existing community. The Meekers came out of Fairfield as we know them up this area, but I did some research a number of years back, and if anybody's familiar with Meekers Hardware Store in Danbury, which is not in service anymore, Hal Meeker, turns out we're cousins, so I did a lot of research about 10, 11 years ago for him. And boy, what a story with the Meekers. It turns out it goes all the way back to the late 1640s, New Haven Colony, and two brothers, one of them who seems to be religious and pious, uh, and the other younger brother, Robert, who's a bit of a ne'er-do-well, seems to be getting in trouble with the colony all the time, uh, but he eventually finds uh, a mate. Uh, by the name of Susanna Tuberfield, who is actually an indentured servant who had come up from Barbados. They get married. However, she makes the mistake of making a big admission to one of her friends after they're married uh, and telling her that when before she got married to Robert, that they got a little bit tipsy one night and engaged in premarital sex. Uh, as a result, they were both publicly whipped and exiled out of the New Haven colony. They ended up having to go live with the Dutch, but by the early 1660s, they're in Fairfield, and they're accepted by part of Fairfield. Now, I won't go into the details, but there is a big difference between the colony of New Haven and the colony of Connecticut, of which Fairfield is part of. As I was alluding to, there's a schism within the family. You've got Jonathan Meeker settles up in the ridge by the 1730s. Meanwhile, his brother, Joseph has settled over in West Reading on the property we're sitting in right now. You got a full 200 acre parcel of land that he purchased in 1724 and bought it really with the logistics of the Sagatok River running through it and soon after establishing saw what was happening because all the land in this area was being auctioned off, saw the opportunity to set up a grist mill Later on, the family set up a sawmill and a cider mill, all of them water-driven, all of them dependent upon the Saugatuck River, the dam that we're familiar with just outside the door here at the bottom of Diamond Hill Road. That was the original Joseph Meeker Dam that powered their grist mill as early as 1728. Now, most of the story takes place on the Reading Ridge. This is a great early postcard image of Christ Church, and if you take a look, the steeple's actually different than it is now. Uh, this dates back to actually a, a, a modernization of the church, uh, sort of in a Gothic revival style in the late 1880s. This church, the church that we're familiar with, was built in 1733, uh, and it replaced an earlier church that went back to 1750. Interesting, in the 1830s, Everybody in town was putting new churches in. It was part of what's known as the Second Great Awakening of a religious revival, which really swept the whole east coast of the United States and had its impact on Reading. 
but it almost looks as if there was a competitive movement going on between the Episcopalians, the Congregationalists, and the Methodists. One of the characters within the book that they get attention to is Reverend John Beach. He's a real person. He's one of the early converts. He was actually ordained a Congregationalist, uh, although he never was settled uh, with his own congregation. So, in the Congregationalist system, he wasn't fully ordained. You were not ordained fully within a Congregational church until you had a congregation that accepted you which is one of the things that a lot of the ministers after 1710 or so were questioning whether that, that was a proper authoritative way in order to receive uh, their indoctrination within the church and as a result a lot of them turned away. John Beach was one of them. He was an early convert to the Episcopal Church. However, at the time, we didn't call it the Episcopal Church. It was known as the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in foreign parts. So apart from coming into New England, they were going to places like India. As the British Empire was expanding, they were trying to get the churches of England in there, and they were intent, very intent, on trying to get into the Congregational Puritan Stronghold of New England. Some of you may have heard the story, and uh, the fact that some Patriot soldiers took a pot shot at him during the Revolutionary War because he refused to basically give his sermon on behalf of the Church of England and the King of England. So the Reverend Beach, he was a stock character. He served for probably 48 years between Newtown and Reading. Took great pride in it. He was a strong loyalist and an ardent supporter of the crown. And at a time when many of the local governments in the colony of Connecticut, soon to be state of Connecticut, were clamping down on the Episcopal churches in Connecticut for the fact that they were running contrary to the belief and to the ideologies being espoused by the standing government, they didn't. With John Beach. They basically let him alone to a great extent. As I said, the Society for the Propagation of the Bible in Foreign Parts, it says so right on its headstone. So you'll hear some people say, well, it's the Anglican Church. It is. It is the Church of England. However, it is not about to use any of the terminologies within Connecticut that associated them with the Church of England because it's basically bad PR. Okay. There is actually a sounding board in the possession of the Episcopal Church here in Reading with a musket ball lodged in it. Because when they took a pot shot at him, they apparently stepped in the church while he was giving the sermon. He refused to stop. They also requested that he put away his Book of Common Prayer, which a lot of the Congregationalists uh, took offense to. And someone with a, uh, um, what are we going to say, not a musket, but a pistol, a flintlock pistol, took a pot shot at him, missed him, but the musket ball lodged in what's referred to as the sounding board above his head. Because at the time, in order to get someone's voice to broadcast on the other end of the church while giving a sermon, there was a system of boards behind them to project the sound. Stephen Betts plays a role within the book. Captain Stephen Betts, in most of the early things you'll see him referred to as Lieutenant Stephen Betts. He served with the Reading Militia. He was also a tavern owner. He inherited a tavern through his father, Stephen Sr., originally a family out of Norwalk. Originally, Stephen himself was over in the west end of town, but he settled with his parents to run the tavern up on Reading Ridge. This is the house for many years, and if you look in the book, this is the house that's alluded to as being Bet's Tavern. Now at the time that the book was written, that was sort of a given by everybody in town. This was Stephen Bet's Tavern. Then somebody started to poke around a little bit further and it came to light that quite possibly this wasn't the same building that was standing at the time of the Revolutionary War. And in fact, that building may have been a little bit to the north, across the other side of Church Hill Road. 
However, when I started to look at some of the deeds, I realized, well, no, there was another road just south of this that actually went down to someone's orchard. So right now it's in limbo, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity, or I'll have an opportunity to be able to examine the house a little more closely to determine if it in fact may be the original Betts Tavern or a later building. So, Stephen Betts, who was also a selectman here in town, he also served as a deputy. A lot of people, and I get inquiries from people all the time saying, so-and-so is a deputy here out of Reading, therefore they assume they were a sheriff or in some way uh, in law enforcement. That's not the case. The term deputy back in this period was you were the representative from your town at the General Assembly up in Hartford. So there's a big difference there. One of the things that comes up in the book, oh, before I get into that, I just uh, didn't realize it, I always assumed for the fact he served the Patriot cause all the way through the war. It was in several, it was up uh, on his way to Montreal. I don't know if he actually made it to Quebec City. And the winter and the famous uh, siege of Quebec in 1775. Uh, however, every time the militia was called out and ready, if he was around, he showed up there. The interesting part was he was a member of the Episcopal Church. And we can determine that for the fact that he's buried in the Episcopal Churchyard. Sadly, we can't verify it through a paper trail because the records in the 1830s were absconded with by one of the disgruntled meekers. However, recently someone told me, you know, there are copies of those records down at the DAR headquarters in Washington, so I need to follow up on that. Um, and there's actually two incidents with the Port Church, someone's run off with the records. There's also another reference there in the book. They refer to him as a colonel, but in fact he was General Samuel Holden Parsons, who came to Reading in the 1778-79, and if any of you are familiar with the land acquisition made by the town of Reading uh, back in 2002, in conjunction with the Nature Conservancy, they bought 50 acres of land off the Limekiln Road that is now called Parsons Preserve, which at one time was regarded as being the, the most significant undisturbed Revolutionary War site in the country. And it's here in Reading. Okay. <coughs> I've been in contact with a few people, Canadians, those descended from some of the loyalists that had to leave ready during the Revolutionary War, and it turns out, although I couldn't find any genealogical reference in the paperwork that I had, this gentleman was able to piece together the fact that Captain Stephen Betts' sister, Hepzibah, actually married one of the loyalists, and she herself ended up in Brunswick, Canada after the war, and to this day her descendants are still Canadians, and one of them uh, actually ended up moving to Danbury, having no idea his roots actually came from this neighborhood at the time. Anybody heard of William Heron? Oh, we've got one person here. Yeah, he's in the book. Yeah. Well, he's, he's infamous. He's made a name for himself in Revolutionary War academic circles as being one of possibly George Washington's spies. Uh, he was definitely a spy in the Revolutionary War. He's an interesting character. He showed up in Reading in the, just before the Revolutionary War. The word is that he came up from uh, Greenfield Hill, the north part of Fairfield, and settled in Reading. He uh, was very erudite, apparently. Uh, a man that's supposedly of upper class, he had a gold-handled cane, uh, he wore velvet breeches, um, and everyone held him in the high esteem. And he was a deputy for Reading for year after year, during the Revolutionary War and after the Revolutionary War. Actually, the, one of the first Masonic lodges that was set up in Reading was with his name. And he actually was the first master of one of the lodges in Reading between 1797 and 1798. So the Masonic Lodge put a nice granite monument right in front of his headstone up in the Episcopal Church Cemetery. Um, the house that you see in the picture down below became his house at one point. 
And it was actually, he bought it from the Reverend John Beach in 1772, when John Beach, I think, decided to spend most of his time in Newtown. You have to understand, Reverend John Beach, who served with the Episcopal Church here in Reading, also oversaw the Episcopal Church in Newtown, which is believed to be the third church ever established in Connecticut at the time. Sadly, when this photograph was taken in the 1890s, the house was abandoned and was being used as a barn. This house, which is really quite a magnificent salt box, uh, used to stand where South Lane is, if you're familiar, just south of the Episcopal Church, a little roadway that goes down there with several houses on it, and this house was located there. Yes. Um, you said he was a triple spy. Yes. I didn't follow the logic. Which yeah. was he really on? <laughs> yeah. He fed information, and there's a, still a debate about it. Uh, he served both the British, gave him information. He also served the Patriot forces, but he also served himself, first and foremost. So that's how you become a triple A. You don't necessarily have a real allegiance to either side, you're just trying to profit for your own gain. Okay. One of the interesting things about him is there was actually, and we're familiar with Major Andre and Benedict Arnold and the letter, the famous letter that was on Major Andre uh, that was supposed to go to Benedict Arnold when they were setting up Arnold's uh, betrayal to the, the American forces to hand over West Point to the British. Uh, and it was just by accident they caught Major Andre. That information had also been passed on to William Heron about a week before, and he never forwarded it. Now, the question is, why did he not forward it? And there was an inquiry, actually, up in Newburgh, New York, within a couple of years after the Revolutionary War, and he was called to explain himself on this uh, for the fact that his failure to forward that on to the Patriot forces, to Washington's army, really reflected that he was his interest was uh, serving the British. Nothing ever came of it. However, nobody in Reading knew anything about this at the time. William Heron got to go on, live his days out, and be highly respected in the community, continued to serve as a deputy for many years in Reading. It wasn't until the 1880s, and an academic, from New York was over in London looking in the British archives and came across the Clinton papers <clears throat> and Governor Clinton, the British governor of New York during the occupation, and suddenly found all these documents referring to William Heron. Well, that blew the lid off of the Revolutionary War academic world in the late 1800s. And what it did do was a lot of people interpreted it as being the General Samuel Holden Parsons was a potential double uh, betrayer of the Patriot cause. Uh, for the fact that William Heron had written the British saying, oh, I think I can, I, I live next door to General Parsons up on Reddy Ridge, and I think I can bring him over to our side. Give me a little bit of money and maybe I can help that cause out. So it took years, and actually, General Samuel Holden Parsons' grandson, I believe grandson, or either or else possibly great-grandson, to really go to bat. And they had articles in the New York Times, there were papers presented at the New York Historical Society, and all the academics got involved. In the end, for the most part, General Samuel Holden Parsons' reputation withheld the onslaught. But it was all because his character out of Reading Ridge that brought all this on. Now, it's had stones up there in the Episcopal Cemetery. He dies 1819. He says, I said, triple agent wasn't discovered until later on. One of the things is that he put himself and always presented himself as a highly educated man who had graduated from Trinity College in Dublin. And he was a native of Cork, Ireland. Now, trying to get, there's not too many Irish people that settled in this part of the woods during that period. Uh, someone who just, in the last couple of years, came out with a book about George Washington's spies, 
did the research on William Heron and can find no record of him actually having attended Trinity College in Dublin. <laughs> this character in the book has caused, caused a lot of grief for the local history buffs over the years. I first heard about it through the late Margaret Wickstead, who would go on for hours about how it misrepresented really the incidents in Reading and this character, Jerry Sanford, uh, for the fact that in the book, he's a good friend of Tim Meeker's. We understand that he's basically about Tim's age. We don't know Tim's exact age through most of the years of the book, but we know he starts off as a pre-adolescent. And in the book, when they're addressing the incident where the British come through Reading, Jerry Sanford gets captured, and he's taken by the British, and he's held captive in New York City, and he dies in a prison ship there. Well, the reality is there is a, not Jerry Sanford, but a Jeremiah Sanford. Well, it turns out Jeremiah, in fact, was 19 years old when he was captured, so basically he was an adult, he was serving with the Reading Militia when everybody was captured, and he did die while in prison in New York City. So it's true, but the age is wrong. You know, okay, as I said here, based on the 19-year-old person in reality, Tad Sanford, I think, is here. He's done a little more research. At one point, we're trying to figure out whether or not his father, Daniel Sanford, it's his name, we never got onto the monument a few years back up on Reading Ridge. Uh, whether he was captured as well too, whether it was the same Daniel Sanford. And at the time when William Edgar Grumman was putting together a lot of this research uh, back in 1904, oh, and just to get a plug for it, William Edgar Grumman was the first librarian for this library here. Okay. Um, I believe Taz has been able to verify, in fact, that yes, Daniel was the father of Jeremiah Sanford. He, too, was captured and imprisoned. He came home shortly after, within a couple of weeks afterwards. However, he was sick when he came back. And he contracted something while he was in prison in New York City and died by July of 1777. One of the other things we get questions about every so often is this field. If you read the book and you know the fact that they talk about the training grounds and actually uh, Tim Meeker, when he's going off to see Betsy Reed, he's always running across this field and over the fences and when he's going to go see his brother at Putnam's encampment there, this is the field they talk about. And here we are, we have this field, we're very fortunate here in Reading that this field is known as Character's Field and was gifted to the Reading Land Trust a few years back, so it saved in perpetuity. So you look at it now, and then you realize back in the 1770s, this was also an open field at the time, because that's where the militia members, the train band, trained. And actually, Reading had several train bands at the time, depending on the geographic area you were in. There was one in Reading, East Park Reading, which would have been here, Reading Ridge, you had one in the center, and you had a train band down in West Reading as well. Interesting part about this is, this is what this field looked like in the 1870s. Most people have no idea that actually that was a little commercial hub at one time. And it was Francis Sanford, and that's his house there. And to the left, you can just barely see to the left of the trees, that's his store. And if you were to go further left than that, you actually have a meeting hall for the Order of Odd Fellows here in Reading. The interesting part is, though, even though that field was left open as a train band training site, during the Revolutionary War, the Reading East train band was disbanded. And they were disbanded because, and not surprisingly, they're up on Reading Ridge, they finally got called out for active duty, you might say, to go to the defense of New York, and the other train bands all went down to serve their cause, and the Reading East train band refused to go. And their captain, uh, Daniel Hill, and his uh, subordinate officers all refused collectively 
to go serve the Patriot cause if they'd been sort of called out for it because they were all loyalists. And for at least two years were keeping a low profile going out. Nobody had any idea until they finally got called out for active service. I have a question. Yep. The vantage point, is that the corner of Cross Highway and 58, or is that further down than 58? A little bit further down. That is if you were to stand, well, let's say on the walkway uh, next to the Episcopal Church now and look due north. You'd be looking at that there. You can actually see after a heavy rain, there's two distinct pool areas where the water doesn't drain out properly because you've got two cellar holes uh, still there from those buildings. One of the more gruesome incidents in the book, and Gene and I were talking earlier as to why some school boards in this country have banned this book and that I think everyone hopefully holds so dear to themselves. Uh, apart from a little bit of the language that's used there, I think a lot of it has to do with really the descriptions of some of the violence. And one of the more unsettling ones is an account given in the book where a slave is beheaded by a British officer. That is true. That is Ned Smith, even though in the book they alluded to him as a star. However, it didn't happen in Reading, it happened in Danbury. Uh, and that was verified a good 30, 40 years ago. Again, somebody doing research over in the archives in Great Britain and found the officer's account of what transpired when they first entered Danbury uh, the night that they were there to burn it. And they actually came across, uh, I don't believe he might have been a lieutenant, but he wasn't a captain star, whose name is used in the book. On Main Street in Danbury, when the British arrived, someone's firing at them with their muskets out of the second story of a house on Main Street. The British go in and charge it. This officer goes up the stairs and encounters Ned. And basically, and the, the description he even gives is pretty explicit as to attacking him with his sword and putting him down and literally decapitating him there. Now one of the things that the character of Ned brings up that a lot of people aren't aware of in Reading was the amount, or I should say, the prevalence of slavery in the 18th century. It was a reality here. Um, uh, recently, I should say about two years ago down in Fairfield, they did an exhibit about uh, slavery in Fairfield, and it was estimated that one out of seven households in Fairfield, now in that case it's Lower Fairfield, uh, possessed slaves. Those slaves also served uh, during the Revolutionary War. Um, I, we don't know about Ned, if he was there on behalf of his owner, Samuel Smith, uh, but we do have records now. I was able, I've been able to verify two uh, slaves that actually were put in to fulfill quotas for soldiers in the Continental Army. Both of them had belonged to Aaron Sanford. Uh, and uh, so we do know that is a reality. Um, it also brings to light about this property. Can anybody recognize this barn here? Is that Neil? Yeah. yeah. It's at the bottom of Cross Highway. The grill is on the property now. I'm showing the barn here because the original house is no longer standing. The original house goes back to the would have gone back to the 1730s. There's a Greek Revival 1820s house on the property, but there was an earlier house where the Hollies settled. They came up from Stratford, uh, Stratford. They were strong supporters of the Episcopal Church. They were also prominent slave owners. A couple of things come to light doing some of the research on the Hawley family. I've been in contact with some of the black Hawley descendants. Uh, some live here in Connecticut, some live down in Maryland now. Um, but the fact is, that the Hollies, while they were in Reading, became quite a prominent family, quite wealthy, uh, and using slave labor, they also had a malt house. And if you're familiar with Cross Highway, you know the old telephone exchange building, uh, the white uh, concrete building just to the east of that building, from what I could determine, was the location of the malt house. So it tells us that the malt 
production would have been serving really people like the Meekers right in the tavern to make their beer and ale. Okay, quick point here. Cowboys within the books, they talk about that. That's where that they loses his father. Uh, the re that's a reality, no question about it. One of the things that we've come across here in Reading was Joel Merchant. He was putting his pension application in in the 1830s. It was in a great detail describing when he was stationed in Greenwich that they went out and actually went into Westchester County uh, to retrieve 200 head of cattle that had been stolen. Joel Merchant, you know the stone house here on Merchant Road? That's his house. He's quite well for himself. Oh, and while I'm at it, just remember, it's not Martian Road, it's Merchant Road, okay? No French people lived around here back then, and some of them have changed their name to M-E-R-C-H-A-N-T. Try to wrap it up here. Uh, the book refers to Generals Worcester, Benedict Arnold. Did they actually show up here when they're chasing that? You're darn right they did. Okay, here's a monument. Here's, it goes back to 1935. When Connecticut was celebrating its tercentenary for the fact that that's where Worcester and Arnold met to make a decision as to whether to go into Danbury, which General Worcester did. Tragically, he was killed the next day. Damon Douglas, great guy, unfortunately passed away, was a surveyor in the, out of Wilton, uh, was able to verify and came across the records where Benedict Arnold was writing correspondence from West Rennie the following morning. So, the, uh, it's believed that, yes, he actually took his soldiers and went along Cross Highway, spent the night down at Umbawag Road and Old Reading Road. So, maybe George Washington didn't sleep here, but Benedict Arnold did at a time when he was still a good guy. <laughs> a little bit I alluded to about Jeremy Sanford, taken prisoner. The other thing that one of the, some of the locals were disgruntled about was for the fact that if you read the book, you get the impression only three people out of Reading were captured. And the fact is actually, apart from Ned, uh, who lost his life, actually 15 of the Reading militia were captured. If you read the old books, Charles Burke Todd, uh, William Edgar Drummond's Revolutionary Soldiers of Reading, they talk about the fact that they were captured at Couch's Rock. So, you can imagine for many years of going, where the hell's couch is rock? Well, I actually got together with the Western Town historian, he had his theories, and I was able to verify that. We'll get that in a minute because I'm leaving that at the very end. Okay, one of the things it talks about is Sam Meeker, as he's waiting trial, they talk about him being in the stockade <coughs> up at Putnam Park. The fact is, down on Umbawag Road, the real guardhouse was there which stood up until about 1910, uh, was torn down by a Frenchman, by the name of Guillaume, uh, sadly built a not shingle style house himself, and across the road at the intersection of the northwest corner of Topstone Road and Umpawak Road is where General uh, Putnam's headquarters was. Sadly, that house was taken down from what we can figure probably in the, just before the Civil War, 1850s, 1860s period. Some of the hardware from that house uh, is at the Reading Historical Society. Okay, they talk about the execution in the book there it is pretty darn close to the realities. And the fact is you had, now in this book here we talk about, I think it's Smith, they talk about, uh, and then Sam Meeker is the one character because he's been convicted of stealing cattle. Even though he's not, he's basically framed for it, but he gets uh, himself, he gets shot by a firing squad, the other gentleman gets hung. That's true. Although it wasn't Sam Meeker, uh, one fellow was named Smith, one was Jones, one was for desertion, and the other was accused of being a spy. Uh, about all accounts, as it shows in the book as well, too, when they did the firing squad, that it was so close that they shot at him that actually his clothes caught fire. And they talk about it in the book, it's a pretty gory description. And the fact that after being shot with the musket balls and he's convulsing on the ground, that were all the contemporary descriptions as well too as to what really did happen. That is a view from about 1904 out of William Edward Grumman's book of Gallows Hill Road. And if you're familiar with the bottom down by Reading Road, Route 53, 
looking up past Stiefel's farm. Doesn't look anything like that now. Of course, all of it's pretty heavily grown in since then. The other thing that's always been a point of contention dealing with the book was the map that they got here. And I'm not quite sure. I never had a chance to talk. To be honest, I would have been embarrassed even bringing it up to Chris Collier. Uh, the fact is, how did they get it so very long about the British route that they actually took coming up? And he you know, goes into more detail explaining. Uh, they say that they came up what we know as Newtown Turnpike now. Well, Newtown Turnpike did not exist then, as we know it. Uh, it wasn't, didn't get chartered until 1829. They really didn't get construction going until after 1830. Uh, so that map that within the book has caused a bit of a problem over the years. So, I spent many years, and I was talking about trying to find Couch's Rock. Couch's Rock is not easily accessible, believe me. Um, but it's on the east side of the Sagatok Reservoir. It's a massive glacial erratic that, for whatever reason, the glaciers just sort of plopped it on top of what's known as an esker, which is a ridge area there. But it's one single stone that's only that's over 35 feet in diameter. It sits up there. I picked on in there with other people, and we discovered there's fire bags up there. We discovered you get on top of this rock. And you can see Long Island Sound quite clearly there. So it had strategic significance at the time during the Revolutionary War. Part of the reason why I was able to find that, though, we're looking at 1934 aerial photographs. And I discovered a road back there that didn't show on any maps. And the oldest map that we have showing roads is 1856. When I got in contact with Damon Douglas, he did the surveys, did the checkup and paperwork. We went out in the woods. And we were able to determine it was known as the Bradley Upright Highway that was abandoned well before 1850. So, how did the Reading, and this is the last thing I'll leave you with, the Reading militia allow itself to get captured by the British, all 15 of them, to the point where even one of them, Timothy Parsons, ended up recounting years later that the British took his musket and smashed it against the rocks and said, never more will this gun be pointed at a British soldier. It sounds a little bit reckless. There's some academics out there that figure people like Joel Barlow disassociated themselves with Reddy because of the embarrassment caused by so many militia members getting captured. There were close to 60 patriots that were captured during Triumph's raid, but there were hundreds and hundreds the soldiers that came down. So if you look at it on a per capita basis, Redding really took a whoop of that time. Well, from what we can determine, Damon Douglas, bless his heart, we spent many hours trying to figure all this out because we knew, and if you look at the purple pink line, that's Black Rock Turnpike on the right hand side. And that's where we got a little pointer here. Going up along here, here's Newtown Turnpike, 1829, we know it doesn't exist. So the theory is that actually the militia members did not congregate in Reading Ridge, as some people have inferred over the years, but actually probably a Reading Center, because forget, you know, remember, Reading Ridge is loaded with all the loyalists, and yeah, someone squealed on them. So they probably came down Sanford Town Road, turned on to what is now known as present-day Newtown Turnpike, although extended up to Giles, or Giles Hill Road, and went along down this abandoned road, the Bradley Upright Highway, by Couch's Rock. And their intention was to go along this road here, which still exists, although all the houses were removed and burned in the 1930s by Bridgeport Hydraulic Company, and you need a permit to get in here. But Zen Road is still there. So the idea was the Reading Militia was going to come down here do a sneak attack on the rear which is a common practice, and that's how Worcester ended up getting killed as well too, was to harass the rear guards of an army that was much larger than your forces were. But these poor guys got all the way down here, and there was no doubt that there was a planking party of British that were coming up the Bradley Upright Highway, which starts off and at one point actually meets up with Black Rock Turnpike down in Greenfield Hill where the British had spent the night before, so chances are, first thing in the morning, they realized 
that there was a good chance the local militias were going to try to ambush them at some point. And they sent out scouting parties off the other road running parallel to it, unbeknownst to the ready militia. And as a result, by the time they met at this interception here, they were overwhelmed by the British, all taken, taken captive, bound and tied up and put in the back of ox carts, and had to endure the next three days of going through Reading with the British, being bound up in the back of these ox carts, having to witness Danbury being burned, including one of the Bartlett's having to watch his brother's house being burned. Danbury going through the Battle of Richfield all the way back down again the following Monday and being taken on the British ships and then carted off and imprisoned in New York in certain places. Not the prison ships in most instances. There was a place called the Sugar House, which is a large warehouse where several of them had died, uh, as well as the, like the Episcopal Church, excuse me, Anglican Church in New York City, uh, which was also used to house prisoners as well, too. So, I think that's resolved after well over 200 years as to how the poor gentleman from Reading who went out to defend their town and serve the Patriot cause ended up in prison and in three cases dying while in prison. Thank you. Well, Charlie. Question is. You know, I just wanted to say, I've gotten to know Charlie a bit over the last couple of months, and he's told you maybe 1% of what he knows about Reddy. Right? So this, this guy is a wonderful resource. And he has very kindly, as part of this Brother Sam Reed series, he's offering, probably at the end of July, the date's not fixed yet, or the very beginning of August, to have essentially office hours with Charlie Couch. And so... You know, he's going to make some time available. If you want to ask what was happening in your neighborhood 200 years ago or 100 years ago, Charlie will have some, uh, as I found, you know, there was a stone quarry in my backyard I didn't know about. Um, but he's helped me with that. So, questions for Charlie? Yep. Yep. Folks? Yep. I was wondering if this presentation might be available to us in some way. I could run the internet or... Or maybe myself, I don't know. Well, we've got Bob Moran in the back who's videotaping it, and he does a wonderful job. And so it'll be, and then he'll probably edit it, and then he'll splice in <coughs> actual slides and cells there so that the resolution looks good. Uh, and post it at reading79.org. And our address. And the Reading Historical Society website, of which we've actually we're building up a nice library of videos there. Uh, the, over the years that I've given on presentations. So it's, we're getting pretty thorough. This fall at the Historical Society's annual membership meeting, I'll be wrapping up, I'll be presenting my fourth installment on Reading history, which will cover uh, World War II to the present. So we've already got three installments. We have Reading's pre-parish history up to 1729. We've got uh, parishes are going from 1729 to 1787, and then we've got another one that covers basically the 19th century up through uh, World War II. Uh, so they're pretty, and they can be long. Um, actually, I'm sort of proud of myself. I got this in under the wire. Um, <laughs> sorry. I can tend to, I can get long with it. Yep. You mentioned the preserve, the Nature Conservancy, um, mm -hmm. took over on Lime Hill. Yes. It's hard to find. I give tours every year or two, and we get a little group together of people and go out there, and we did it last summer. Um, and people can always give me a call, I'll gladly help people get out there. It's a preserve, it's also uh, an archaeological preserve. Uh, three summers, Dr. Lori Weinstein, who's actually out of the anthropology department, at Westcon has done uh, archaeological research there, uh, and as a result, it was set up. And actually, Putnam Park was the first archaeological preserve set up in the state, and this one has received a similar designation, meaning that if anyone went in there to tamper with anything, and people going with metal detectors or whatever, 
get caught, uh, they can serve or they can serve jail time and very serious uh, 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 fines. So as a result, we always try to be a little bit cool. It was such a tricky issue given at the time because you didn't want to broadcast it really outside of Reading because there are these, you know. Uh, metal detector hounds that like to go around. We've had incidents where they've gone on actually Carriker's Field, the people being caught out there with metal detectors. Um, and the idea is not uh, to have or allow anybody to go in there and intentionally disturb uh, the sensitivity to the site. So if you want at some point there, feel free to give me a call um, and I'll, I'll give a tour and if we can get more people together, it's always a great thing to do. Uh, Mike, yes. Norman, the, the kind of the dotted road that goes from Black Rock to Couches Rock. Yes. Is that near the Little Egypt section? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh, we just referred to it as the Den Road. Now that was later on became an African. We're not quite sure. It's real. I know it was an African American community all the way through the 19th century. You've got to realize that most of the slaves uh, received manumission in the late 18th century into the early 19th century in Connecticut. Some of it had to do with the laws and the way they were. Uh, 1783, the, the, the state enacted certain legislation that as soon as anybody that was born a slave, uh, after 1783, as soon as they reached the age of 25, they automatically received their freedom. Uh, then you had other ones, and in some cases, some of the people that converted to Methodism early on, you could tell had a change of heart. Uh, with regard to being slave owners, and they started to release their slaves as well, too. Uh, we got to figure, where did they go? Now, many of them stayed with the families they had actually been slaves to, to work as farmhands. But some of them, and this is the whole thing, and a number of years ago, I worked with the uh, Gilder Learner Center at Yale University on African American Studies and Slavery to do documentation on this area down here known as Little Egypt, uh, and it's believed that a lot of the uh, freed slaves ended up taking up residence down there, and primarily for the fact that it was undesirable land. It was very rocky, uh, uh, and, and just not suitable for proper plow land. Uh, so a lot of them, the husbands and the families that lived there, the husbands would uh, work out at other people's farms. Uh, and the wives would stay home, and if you look at some of the census data from the mid-19th century, the number one thing the, 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 the wives were doing, they were basket makers. So, okay, yep. Back to the militiamen that were captured, uh, is there any documentation on where they, if they died on the ships or in uh, the sugar house? Both places were pretty horrible. Yes, yeah, really yeah. Horrible. Yeah, in St. Paul's Episcopal Church, I think, yeah. St. Paul's. Uh, the only Go-to reference I've used over the years was William Edgar Grumman's uh, Revolutionary Soldiers of Reading. Um, and he spent time primarily in Hartford doing his research, but where he was able to find out where they died, he, he says that. Uh, so they were split up, they were sent to different prisons. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, it's commonly assumed one of the people, Daniel Chapman, uh, tragic story who lived on Limecombe, at the bottom of Limecombe Road down here in Route 53, had like a three year old son at home, young wife. Uh, I've come across several different references. I mean, either it was the Sugar House, came across something, his name is on a tablet uh, uh, in New York City, uh, somewhere along the East River, uh, which lists all the names of the various uh, people that died in the prison ships, and his name's there, so we're not 100% certain, but take your pick. It was a pretty ugly way to go, no matter which, yeah. which way it went. Yep, and there was somebody else that was? No? Yep. Um, how difficult is Couch's Rock to find? Because I really like to find it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> there's a couple of ways you can go in. Well, there's three ways you can go. The first time I went in, I went down along the edge of the reservoir and then went inland and that was all based upon what I saw in this 1934 aerial photograph. However, the aerial photographs don't really give you a good idea as to the terrain. <laughs> so there were like, it was the third ridge 
And it was also December, or no, January when I went in there, although a relatively <coughs> mild day, but the day was really short. And I got in there, sort of looked around and everything, and realized the sun was setting. Sort of ran cross country to get over to Greenbush Road to eventually get out of there. Um, the other way is actually coming through Den Road. Now that's a that's an easy hike, but it's still a long hike because you can park. You, no matter what, you still need a permit uh, from Bridgeport Hydraulic, from Gary Haynes down at the Aspen Top Orchards. He's a great guy. Uh, there, or the other option is coming down. Continuing on Greenbush Road, which turns into what was known as the Burr Operate Highway, uh, into technically, if you go past the Grand Scott property, if anybody's familiar with the open space down there, uh, until you hit uh, the Den Road, and you can go up that way too. The dramatic way to see it is coming along the edge of the reservoir, because you're coming up over the ridge, you've got a valley, you've got to go over sort of streams, and you go up another ridge, and when you go, you cross that second stream over the second bridge, some of you are looking up. <laughs> I'm sorry. There we go. No. Charlie, yes. where is it, where is the reservoir, um, and where is Route 53 on that, on that map? You won't see 53, you'll see 58. So here's 58, Black Rock Turnpike. Um, oh, is 53 much farther over? Uh, yeah, 53 is oh, way over see. here. So we can't, I mean, we're not even showing it. So here's Lone Town Road here. Uh, as I said, President Daniel. So here's, think of the reservoir. Here's the reservoir down here. So it's sort of the northeast corner of the reservoir. And there's actually a jet of land that comes down. And, and this road actually continues. You can find the roadbed down there. There's a whole bunch of roadbeds down there. Low. Uh, but here's the shoreline, and so you have to go along the edge of the shoreline, it gets sort of rocky. Um, but and where's the, the reservoir at that point? The reservoir is all this area in here, that's all the oh, reservoir. Oh, that side. Right there. Well, you see, Newtown Turnpike goes and wraps around okay. the top of the reservoir. Sure. Okay, so here we are in the northeast corner of the reservoir. Here. So, but yeah, there's nothing here. It just showed up as you can make out looking at the tree line, really, from the 1934 aerial photographs. Charlie? Yep. There is actually a fourth way now. The oh. Connector Trail from the Saugatuck Trail comes down from Newtown Turnpike. There's a new bridge the Boy Scouts built right down there by oh. Saugatuck Town Road. Yeah. Yep. And it kind of cuts between all of those roads, but the trail is out there. It's hikeable. You can't park anywhere. Right, but it comes down to Den Road and comes out next to Den Road. Oh, okay. So it's a that U. Wow. So that's just in this area here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very good. And it's well marked. It's only about three years old. So. Well, that's yeah. And then I haven't been in there in probably seven, eight, nine it, it years. It just doesn't look like it's that far in. Yeah. yeah don't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't be deceived. This map is not to scale. <laughs> Chuck, um, Jake is wondering about the Huntington um, State Park tour or something. Sunday. Sunday. Do you know anything about that? Oh, um, uh, 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 Murphy here. Yeah. Uh, Chris Murphy. Uh, Chris Murphy's going to be here. No, I just saw a quick little blurb on Facebook, I think, saying that they're doing it. I don't know. Nine o'clock, I think. Nine o'clock, and they meet at uh, at the entrance to. Uh, I guess where the bears are road. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and put, you park on San Samuel Road or on the road that goes down. And it's 9 o'clock and it's supposed to be 9 to 10 30. Yeah. And you. that's going down by Lake Hopewell and down the south, southern end, from what I read. Yeah, the south of Lake yeah. Hopewell. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yep. Anyone? Yep. I'm interested in researching the people that are buried in the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me where to, where to start? Where? Yeah. Um, <laughs> about a list of them. Yeah, there's a okay, lot. I've well, done a little bit of work. I found what I could hear on some of them. Well, I'll tell you Ancestry.com. And if you've got access to Ancestry.com. Here in the library, you've got full access. You've got full access. There you go. That is the, the greatest tool now. The 
The other thing that ties in, some of the images that I used here, to be honest, I swiped off of the site Find a Grave. Like those. <laughs> Find a Grave. Find a Grave. all these people punch in all this information and they try to get photographs. And there's people that go out there and it's not as if they're their own relatives that they're researching. They just want to be able to acknowledge these people that are long forgotten in a lot of cases. And they'll transcribe all the information they can get off of the headstones and they put there and post it. And when you do a Google search on a particular name, so usually one out of every three or four times, you're going to get somebody that's put information in find a grave. Now, it's not always correct. Okay? And when I, oh, well, what I discovered is Captain Stephen Betts, which we all know out of Reading, and he died, I believe, 1828. Well, it turns out to be there's a quote, Stephen Betts, that's buried in New Canaan, who died in 1832. And I don't have the heart to tell these people, but the children of the American Revolution that's associated with the D-A-R-S-A-R has a branch out of New Canaan called the Stephen Betts Chapter because of this guy buried there, but from I can make out, he's an uncle. Yes, Hilda? Yes, I'm now I'm really curious. Are there two Stephen Betts in that cemetery, the school cemetery, according to find The Episcopal? Yeah. I didn't find Stephen I mean, Betts from no, this. I found he, he was buried in the Well, this, this little piece I gave you, yep. I, I found a picture of a Stephen Betts married to Sarah, with an A, H, Betts, 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 and then I realized it well, probably wasn't this Betts. So are there two? I just, there's two Stephen Betts. There's no okay. doubt about it. So They're both originally out of Norwalk family. This is recorded on Ancestry.com and I'm great as being in that. And you can find wrong information on the Ancestry.com as well. Too. And actually, and you've got to be so careful sometimes. I came across about Stephen Betts having a negative club. And the Clark's more familiar with. They're usually out of Danbury and at some point came up out of Stratford, I believe. So that I would not, I would be more inclined to think that's the correct one for the fact that most of the New Canaan people are out of Norwalk, Gary Ann, Stanford area. It actually said this church. What's that? It actually said this church. So maybe I've got, I don't know, you look at it. You've got a cross reference. And, 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 and you know, before Ancestry.com got going, uh, there used to be uh, uh, the LDS church, the Mormons, the Latter day Saints, which have this great repository in Salt Lake City with everybody's genealogical information because part of their mission is to um, not baptize but whatever you or they use for it, bring everybody that's ever been born on earth that they can find, bring them in within their fold. You know, that was their mission behind it. Well, they took information from anybody and everybody. And as a result of there was just an incredible amount of misinformation because they were writing down what Aunt Sally told them in 1938. Uh, as to who married whom in what year. And so, you know, early on doing genealogical research, I discovered that's not a reliable source. Ancestry.com, they're now good because you can cite your sources of information. And for the fact that there's so many good reference sources to find your information on Ancestry, that people got pretty good about putting where they got their information from. However, takes one person to put yeah. the wrong information out there and it can spread like wild. Can I just ask you one more thing? Yeah. Um, the wife of that Betts was born in Reading. Is that uh, Adam Reading? You know, you know my family history. Yeah. Um, is the daughter of Adam who you look at my Yeah, or the Adam Clark. So it makes sense. That I she never was, came across Adam. She was that from Reading. Yeah. And I have to check, and even Jacobus... Well, she, he was a constable in Reading, according to her. So he was in Reading, out of Reading. We were okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I always go to Donald Wine. We're very lucky here in Reading because we came out of Fairfield. In 1930, the... Um, I'm trying to think of the 
DA, but there was a women's group out of Fairfield that hired the most, the preeminent genealogist in the country, Donna Lyon Jacobus, to do the Fairfield families. And he produced the most comprehensive, reputable, reliable genealogical collection going all the way back to, you know, 1639 where he could find it, um, all the way up to uh, about 1800 for all the families. And he had a team of researchers that worked with him, but they were all well experienced and very good. And he put together everything. And the library's got the collection of Jacobus' families of Old Fairfield. And that's where I go to. However, speaking about the Betts, the Betts were originally a Norwalk family. So they've got Stephen Betts in there. They allude to his father, Stephen Betts, I believe, senior. Yeah, I thought there were two. In there are two, well, with father and son. And that's what ties in with the building up on, on, uh, on Black Rock Turnpike, the tavern, was the fact that I believe Stephen Betts took it over from his father, wasn't necessarily recorded in the writing of land records. So I don't know how to do this. Is why you need to look at that. This is why, Charlie, that you're going to need to sound out as a Yes, okay, so we're going to. So yeah, it's fine. We can we'll figure out a little bit more on that. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so much.